Hello and welcome to INSEAD's LeaderCast series. Uh, my name is Charles Galenick. I'm the Dean of the Executive MBA. Uh, the LeaderCast series is a chance to listen to senior executives from global corporations on the topic of leadership. Today we're very fortunate to have the Senior Vice President of HR from Eli Lilly, uh, Mr. Tony Murphy with us. Mr. Murphy, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and we also have a few snippets of uh, Sidney Torral, the CEO and Chairman, which we'll try to integrate uh, into this particular uh, leader cast. First question I had was around uh, talent wars. Uh, there's a lot of talk today about uh, talent wars. Uh, the demographics uh, seem to be against major corporations who are trying to hire more and more uh, uh, staff, good top talent. Uh, there's going to be fewer younger people in the future. Um, I was wondering, first of all, do you believe there is a talent war? Is, is this something that Eli Lilly feel, feels? Uh, in some ways, we've always had a talent war because the uh, pool of talent that we recruit um, often come with technical or uh, individual capabilities that are, that are valued uh, generally. Uh, and in the pharmaceutical industries, you can imagine we have experts that are extremely valuable. So to some degree, we've always had a, a talent war. Uh, secondly, we've, we've tried to recruit too in terms of business from the best business schools and there you know you're competing with consultancies or with banks or in the dot-com era with the dot-com companies. So um, we've always had that mindset. Do I believe that uh, with the demographic change there will be a greater war for talent? Yes, I think it's already there. I, I think it, it will compel companies um, to think more globally about where they source their talent from and we certainly are doing that. We've done that for many years. A, a global recruitment strategy, a global development strategy, a global diversity mindset, I think, will enable companies to manage uh, that talent scarcity. But there's no doubt with the demographic change, uh, I think companies will increasingly encounter uh, a, a better fight or a greater fight for talent than there has been. So we're not ending there any illusions. And then your value proposition for people that you recruit uh, and develop uh, needs to be even more compelling. Uh, one advantage we have there is that we make medicines and, and medicines can be uh, a, compelling, a compelling mission to have. The other pressure I'm sure it will place on us is the need for leadership. Uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, abiding themes at the moment is that people will have more choices going forward and it's that choice uh, issue that is uh, likely to create the scarcity of talent or the fight for talent because they will choose to do different things with their lives. So just just on that issue, what, what do you see as your major competitors for talent? Uh, if, if people have different choices, uh, maybe different markets will look differently, but uh, uh, is there one source of competition where you may be losing people to or that you see on the horizon? Sure. I mean, within our industry, uh, obviously, uh, that war for talent has always been there with, with big pharmaceutical companies, increasingly uh, biotech companies, small companies, startup companies are looking for talent and they're coming to mature uh, companies like ours for that l management talent. So there's a real draw there that we need to be aware of. But uh, at a deeper level, I think people just have more choices today uh, and exercise those choices. Uh, both on a local and a global basis. And I think that's the environment in which we now operate. Mm -hmm. are, are any regions of the world uh, more competitive than others for you at the moment? Are, are Absolutely. Some um, uh, I don't think there's an easier environment. There are some which are a little less uh, uh, competitive than others. But right now in Asia, for example, um, we have a reputation as a company for taking young talent and developing and growing it. Um, and in countries like China, we frankly source a number of our competitors as a result. Um, and uh, you know, how, you, how you manage that and how you deal with it uh, is a major issue. But there's no doubt that the developing countries like India and China are major uh, areas in terms of turnover of people that we have to account. But there's nowhere that you can really rest on your laurels and say, you know, you, you've got a, an organization or a group of people that you can retain. Uh, essentially, I think, in, and increasingly, you'll be in the re-recruitment uh, battle uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay. There's one question I can't resist asking with an HR executive, which is um, about the, the power and the strength of the HR function uh, in an organization. I mean, HR traditionally has not had as much voice 
um, as probably HR executives would have liked. Um, how have you tried to increase the visibility of, of HR within a company like uh, Eli Lilly to make these things happen? Well, I, I'm fortunate. I may be more fortunate than some of my peer group in as much as uh, Eli Lilly as a company have always had a, a profound view of the importance of human resources. In fact, uh, uh, our first report on human resources was written by the grandson of the founder in 1916. Uh, and that employment report has been a bedrock of why HR is important uh, to the company. You could also think about our model. Uh, we make medicines, uh, and that's uh, a long activity. Uh, keeping people and growing and developing people has been a key element of how you make good medicines. It takes a long time. And so I'm fortunate in as much as I don't have to fight for my place at the table. Now, I have to keep my place at the table, and I'll talk about that agenda at the, in a minute. But I'm a HR professional. I joined uh, Lilly uh, with a PhD in clinical psychology. I taught uh, at a business school in the UK uh, in the HR field. Um, and uh, a number of the people that joined Lilly found uh, in HR uh, uh, something that they've profoundly enjoyed doing, not just as HR professionals. We've been very successful at taking business leaders into HR, either to become HR professionals within the organization or to take that knowledge back out into the business. So unlike, I think, some other companies, we don't have this silo mentality. Uh, HR is a, a role that's valued. Having HR experience uh, is something that adds value to you if you're going back into the business, or you can stay and develop and build a HR career path. And then uh, going forward, um, I believe um, that the challenges of a company in the 21st century will be of essentially people challenges. Um, I, I believe that, uh, and I think my company does it generally, that it's how you uh, engage with talented people, how you encourage them to uh, develop and grow their own leadership, uh, and how you create that environment that's going to be critical. That's a human resource issue that line management own. And that's the other element that I'd say to you um, that I think has helped us in Lilly, which is that collaboration between HR and line. We don't so much supply a service as collaborate in resolving business issues. I think it's a mindset and it's a value issue. Okay, great. Um, we, we talked about the procurement of talent uh, making talent feel at home, welcome, uh, and retain talent. What about when you have to shift the mentality of that talent? Uh, get them to think differently about the business model. Uh, effectively change the culture of the organization to adapt to a new business uh, environment. Uh, could you share a few thoughts about uh, Eli Lilly's um, attempts in the last five years or so to try to transform and mold the culture uh, given the environment that you face? Uh, essentially, I think that comes from the top. You know, at the end of the day, you have to have a chairman and a CEO who is committed to that agenda. And uh, we've been fortunate in Lilly that uh, uh, Sidney Terrell, our chairman, when he came to the uh, uh, CEO seat in 1999, identified and characterized what he described as the uh, barriers to that leadership agenda. Uh, and they were essentially around an inward focus uh, and a conservatism that he recognized was not going to be, uh, was not going to enable us to be successful going forward. So he developed a leadership agenda. Uh, I think that leadership agenda has given us a platform around performance appraisal, around development, around our leadership curriculum for growth, around the kind of leaders that we were looking for that en has enabled us to energize the organization. And at the heart of all of that, we have been fortunate as a company in as much as uh, at the heart of leadership, essentially, I think is a value system. Um, and if you have a, a value system that's fairly strong, then leadership modeling, I think, is a little bit easier. We benefited from the fact that the Lilly family left a very strong value system built around people and integrity and excellence uh, with the company. So that v value system has enabled us, if you like, to manage change, identify different types of behavior, but keep a sense of who we are in a changing world. And I think that's the balance. You know, do you know who you are as a leader? And are you able there 
then to adapt and, and transform to the change that you see. Uh, and I think you know, we've been able to do that so far, uh, I think, in a reasonable way. We've faced our challenges with losses of, of patents, with changes in the marketplace, uh, but we've tried to keep that leadership value system intact. I think it was uh, Peter Drucker that said leadership at the end of the day is about character. Um, so, you know, are you sure about what that character is and what it looks like? Are you able to articulate it to your people? Do you have it role modeled from the top? Because if you don't, then you can say whatever you like. It just will not impact people. At the time of the Prozac patent expiration, when we started this whole effort, um, resistance was fairly limited. What we need, there was a very strong understanding that we needed to do things differently in order to survive. And so the need was to ensure that we were all moving in the same direction and that we had a same understanding of change, but change to what. Uh, and so what we did was, uh, I think uh, um, Tony referred to that, is uh, to very specifically um, articulate what uh, the uh, uh, requirements of leadership that we were looking for were. Uh, so I uh, wrote a, a paper on leadership that was uh, uh, very very, very widely shared with all of our employees and actually also with recruits and, and so forth, uh, where um, uh, I discussed, you know, what, what is it that we are looking for in terms of behaviors. And, you know, I'll, I'll summarize that very, very uh, briefly um, to say that, uh, as, 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 as Tony said, you know, we uh, need for people to be able to uh, not only manage through change, but to lead change. So that's what leadership is about, but you cannot have a successful executives by having only this, the ability to create change. What you need is also what I call stewardship or the management skills uh, that bring order in the midst of chaos. You cannot have one without the other the other. Uh, and you have some visionary leaders who are unable to actually get things done. Uh, so the disciplines and the skills of uh, stewardship or management are still very important. So the, the, we started with saying, okay, uh, um, for the first thing we look for in leaders is, is a set of ethical values which are absolutely essential, the sine qua non condition. And then uh, by going through all the planning, implementation, stages, what are we looking for? Uh, people who first uh, are able to see the forest and not just the tree. In other words, have a broad view of the industry or the department, where we are going. Uh, the ability to um, look at the company from the outside in rather than the inside out. Uh, this uh, external perspective is absolutely essential uh, and a precondition to have the ability to plan strategically. Uh, so that was the second one. The third one is what we call get to the future first, to, to really make sure that we have well-defined uh, goals and that whatever we do in the short term and we need to adapt to the changes, but it's all within an overall direction which is well understood. Uh, then you have to uh, uh, work through people uh, and, and the coaching and mentoring and all of that is extremely important. You need to have good metrics you need to hold people accountable, and you need to uh, um, uh, make sure that you con continuously learn. Uh, and that's one of the biggest challenges in many organizations, you know, it's this ability to continuously learn. Because this requires a very healthy dose of humility. Uh, it, uh, you uh, have to uh, face what you did wrong in a very open fashion. and. Uh, not many organizations are able to do that. And yet, I think it's Peter Drucker who said that uh, the only sustainable competitive advantage a company can have is the ability to adapt to change. Uh, and, and you can only do that if you have an open environment where people are able to say, I did this wrong, and this is what I've learned from it. You recently uh, took on the position of, uh, of global HR head, and I think one of the requirements was for you to go from the UK uh, and uh, into Indianapolis, into the States. Uh, can you talk about 
transformation in the life of a senior executive when, when they are required to, uh, to go across different cultures, to set up uh, not only business but homes and everything else in a different setting. Uh, the personal side of being a global executive, uh, could you add some, uh, some thoughts on that? Well, the greatest challenge uh, was, in fact, to my wife. Uh, and uh, I know uh, executives are not supposed to talk about their partners, but um, in most executives' lives, the partner, uh, the spouse, is an extremely important uh, individual. And in fact, the greatest barrier I had was convincing my wife that we should move to the corporate center in the first place. Uh, having got there, uh, making sure that she was settled and um, and we had good connectivity with our children who remained uh, in Europe was critical. I don't think at the end of the day, um, uh, in today's world anyway, you can ignore the importance of, of that balance. Uh, while we work extremely hard, you need to keep a balance in your life. Uh, and that's been very important to me. So that's the first thing. Can you keep a balance as you step up uh, the level of your activity and the level of your intensity? Because I've always traveled a great deal. I've been fortunate to have global jobs. Uh, but the level of intensity is even greater. The second thing that I, I discovered is that you really need to know the business in a profound way. I knew the business in Europe before and was reasonably assured of myself asking or uh, answering business questions. What I really needed to understand at the different level was the value chain. And from the R&D end to the sales and marketing end and all the pieces in between, that make um, the activity what the Americans call rocket science. What we do in making medicines is rocket science. So how do you get an old brain to understand the, the rocket science? That was the second thing. The third thing is really that you realize that you have to reach people through people, uh, and those people may be quite removed. How do you communicate down through layers uh, a sense of, of who you are? And uh, I've personally done that by trying to travel a great deal, touch people, hear from them directly what the issues are. So you have a, a, quite a responsibility to really get outside the corporate head office because you can spend every day from early in the morning to late at night attending corporate meetings and being inwardly focused. You have to be outwardly focused uh, to your people. And then you have to be outwardly focused to your customer. So I uh, regularly take time to travel with one of our sales representatives and call on doctors. I have external customers who partner with us in healthcare uh, processes. So that's another dimension uh, to being a, a senior executive. And the, th the final thing I, I'd say is at the end of the day, you have to portray the kind of leadership uh, that you are talking about. You have to be authentic. Uh, you have to be real. Uh, and that reality can come uh, at the end of a, a jet lag trip to Asia when you're asked at the very end of a long day a very tough question. That's a moment of truth for an executive. Can you be authentic? Can you be real? Can you listen hard and respond from your heart as well as your head at the end of that very long trip? And as my boss used to remind me of one of the key aspects of being an executive that has become ever more important to me these days is stamina. You need an intellectual, a physical, um, a spiritual stamina about what you do uh, because every moment of every day in some part of the world you're touching people that have to believe in you as a leader, as an authentic leader in a business that they want to remain in and work with. And, and I think that's uh, some of the major things I think that I discovered on my journey. I wouldn't say it's by any means done. Uh, every day I learn, uh, often through mistakes, uh, how I need to raise my game and my understanding um, and my insight to a different level. Uh, in fact, in many ways, this period of my career when I thought I would be uh, winding down, I'm in fact winding up uh, to a different level and different understanding. I've probably never been more energized in my career or in my life than I am now. Uh, and uh, I find it truly exciting, truly demanding, sometimes truly exhausting, but very fulfilling. By the time I became COO, back about 10 years ago or so, I realized that uh, I couldn't be as hands-on as I used to be. Uh, and the, the guys can perhaps testify, oh, you're too long, maybe. <laughs> I, like I was really, so really hands-on. <laughs> uh, and uh, that I had to let go 
uh, of a lot of things and not be involved in the details of the operation and set, set direction and, and trust people. Uh, that was a big change because I, and I was getting a lot of feedback that I was maybe too uh, involved. Um, and I've continued to evolve as my, my jobs have, have, have changed over time. The second thing is uh, I've realized more and more how the soft aspects of management or leadership are important um, and how um, reaching the hearts and minds of employees is essential. Because leadership at the end of the day is to get you know, ordinary people to do extraordinary things and you cannot do that just through management skills and, and through management of objectives and those sort of things. Uh, and, and the last thing is um, uh, more and more as a leader, uh, I see that people are interested in you as a person. And while you know, my attitude was always before, two years <laughs> uh, that's not important, it's not the business, why, why should they care? I'm much more open now to sharing my own feelings and experiences and so forth in a very open and transparent way because people look to leaders for um, they, they want to tr they have to trust their leaders and for that they have to really believe that they know them intimately so it goes way beyond the business. I have to ask with a home in Indianapolis have you taken to motor car racing in American football or is this something that uh, you haven't quite captured yet. No, I am blessed with satellite TV so I can watch rugby. I'm Welsh <laughs> by background and, and rugby is the game I watch. Um, and uh, what you discover is that there's a huge cultural divide where it comes to sports. So I have never taken yet to American football and the Indianapolis Coats is a very strong team. I hear they're doing well. Uh, the basketball and the baseball, while I've gone to the matches, does not excite me like rugby or cricket. And I suspect that's a cultural divide that will always exist. Mr. Anthony Murphy from Eli Lee, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure.